the card like this that is in front of you in the chairs or pockets right there in front of you. If you're on the front row, then you have to reach behind you. But anyway, it's there. Members, this card is for you as well. I know Gary's talked about this, but let me remind you. We are a praying church, and we believe in prayer. If you have a need, do not hesitate. People will pray for that need. Just put on there what you want us to know about it. You don't have to tell your life story, but if you'd like to put a prayer request on there, we want, you to, lift, uh, we want to lift your prayer up, even if you're a guest of ours today. It's a pretty simple card, name, even the email. It's pretty much about boils down to your phone number if you desire to do so. But it's an important card for us to be able to minister to you on a continued basis. So if it's your first time, buckle down. We always have a good time at Believer's Fellowship. In fact, I'm preaching a, a new sermon series we're entitling Thrive. It's really, if you were here last week for our communion service, we kind of shared before we did communion together, uh, vision, passion, direction of our church, where we believe the Lord is leading us and where we're heading in the days ahead. But uh, I believe the Lord has for us as a church, but also for us as individuals, uh, the mindset he wants us to have a, a full, meaningful, complete, and he put it in these words, I've come that you might have life and that you might have that life more but how many people do you know are living that kind of life? I mean, how many Christians do you know that you could say, hey, they're really experiencing that thing called abundant living? You know, we talk about thrive, not just survive, is what we really want to see for our spiritual walks in life. So I want to speak to you today about thriving in your, in your life and thriving in your walk and thriving in, in, your, in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, thriving in your relationship with, with each other, thriving as a church. This is not a prosperity, I'm going to be so super blessed I can't stand myself kind of sermon. All right? Uh, this is all about the practicalities of living on the level that the Lord Jesus Christ would have us live in it with an abundant life. All right? Now, it's important that we realize that abundant life comes by and through and by the operation of Jesus in our life and the Holy Spirit in our life, God working in us as we're submitting to the Word of God. In the last few weeks, we've kind of been building up to this particular series. We talked about salvation and the doctrine, the theology of salvation a few weeks ago. But remember, we said that salvation is not just a one time, I'm going to get saved and give my life to Jesus, I'm going to go to heaven. All right? That's, not, that's just the start. Eternal life begins in the moment I give my life to Jesus Christ. And the very essence of eternal life is that I can have abundant life, all right? But that's, that's living in my salvation, experiencing my salvation. The Bible, we, we use the terminology, I, I have been saved uh, when Jesus comes, or by death, I'm going to be completely saved. I'm going to go into heaven, all right? Complete separation from sin, separation from temptation, separation from the devil. But in the process, you know, between what we saw the cross and the crown, there's this everyday life that we should be living and experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ in this moment of our life. Uh, the Bible uses the word sanctification for that. It's to be made clean, and it's a process of being made clean. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit, where, where God is really working in our life. And if there are areas that aren't right with him, there's a sensitivity and openness and a genuineness with God to let God deal with those things, you know, that are wrong and they don't measure up to his holiness or to his word I'm willing to respond to those things and live in my salvation. That's thriving, all right? That's what the essence is all about. So for the next four to six weeks, depending on how well you listen, we'll uh, talk about thrive and what it means to thrive in our life, not just survive. Today's message is part one of that series, which we call Revive to Thrive. Now, revive is an important word. It's really... Once I give my life to Jesus Christ, you know, and I submit my heart and life to him, and if you've never done that, there's still plenty here for you to, to take away from today, all right? One, hopefully, is Jesus, okay? But <clears throat> once I've given my life to the Lord, and he, he, I begin this relationship with him, there are times when I get dull. There are times when I drift, there are, because I'm still living in this world, all right? And my, I still have this sin nature, although it's been dealt a death blow, so I don't have to do what it says, it's still present. It's not president, if you understand what I mean, but it's still present, unless I let it be president in my life, all right, and then let it take precedent over the Lord in my life. So enough with the word games this morning. Let's get down to what we want to talk about in, in the context of revive. I want to share a message with you out of Malachi chapter 3, so if you have your Bible, we'll be making references back to it so you can have your Bible and keep it open. We'll also have it up on the overhead and the projectors in just a moment, but God is people in Malachi's day. I preached this, I guess it may be six, eight years ago. We did a, a lift group study on the book of Malachi, and we went through a sermon series on Malachi as well. 
And so I, I know that I preached this passage back then. And I, I, it was a passage that I often went to when I would do revivals and evangelism because I was doing, you know, uh, many church revivals every year. Uh, going to a church for the, for the time that we'd set aside to be there for the daily meetings is one of the messages I usually started with from Malachi chapter 3. Now, some of you have been a believer a long time and you're familiar with Malachi and you know that in chapter 3 is that verse that we call a curse for some folks. It talks about giving, you know. I, I may touch on that somewhere, but that's not the context of the message today. The message today is revival. And the context of the message to Malachi, God sent the prophet Malachi to the people so they would experience revival, so they'd come alive, get back in where they used to be. What happens in our salvation? We start living for, the G for Jesus, and then through why however we're tempted or however we're yielding to the world or the flesh or the devil, we get to a place we need cleansing, and we need revival, and we need a fresh start in our, in our spiritual walk in life. You know, this is a good time in January because everybody's always thinking about resolutions. Well, I want to encourage you not to think about resolutions. I want to encourage you to think about revival today in your heart and life. And if you need that reviving where you, you realize in your own life, maybe you become dead spiritually in some areas. Maybe you become dull of hearing. Maybe you've lost the, the enthusiasm of spirit, you know, or the excitement of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the abundant living is not really there. You're, you're kind of just going through the process, you know, it's kind of like getting stuck in the rut. You know our definition of a rut. It's, it's just a grave with the ends kicked out. You just kind of get stuck down in that hole, and you're not really going and growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're perhaps maintaining some disciplines, and the exterior presence there, it looks like you're really maybe going on, but in your heart of hearts, you know where you are, and you realize you need to come to revival. It was one lady asked Billy Sunday, the great evangelist that preceded Billy Graham, in the nation, she said, why do you always talk about revival? Why do we keep having revivals? He said, well, why do you keep taking baths? Uh, we get dirty, all right? We need to get clean. And the same thing happens in our spiritual life. There are times we need to come back to a place of revival. So in Malachi chapter 3, we have what I've, I've turned in the past as we've talked about this. The stages are the steps are the process of how revival works. Now, first of all, it's the word revive. It's not vive. If you don't need Jesus, you need Bible, all right? You need to come alive is what the word means, life. If you are a believer and you have gotten complacent or cold or backslidden in some area of your life, then what you do need, you do need revival, you know, to get back in, get back on fire, get back excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here's, here's how God addresses the people in Malachi's day. So stand with me as we honor the reading of the word this morning, and we'll read through six verses or so here where the Lord is speaking to the church and speaking to his people, the church not yet, his people in the Old Testament. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. Verse 3, and he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Let me back up. went too soon to that slide. Verse 4, and then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against all those who fear, uh, swear falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, against the widow, the orphan, and those who turn aside the, the alien, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Well, basically, the Lord says, I'm going to bring justice. All right? Where there's been wrong, we're going to make it right. Verse 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Say amen and be seated to the word of God. Amen. As we look at this passage and we talk about revival, there are, as I said, some things which are in this process of how, really how God deals with his people. And he is dealing with, the, with Israel, his people. And he's speaking to them about, you know, getting right, getting things settled, and resolving the issues that aren't right in their life. And it's, it, it's not so much a formula as it just is the way that God approaches his people and God approaches any of us, all right? And you'll see this truth, maybe if you don't know the Lord and you're here and you've never really made that genuine commitment to follow Christ, all right, in your life, 
for whatever reason, maybe you didn't feel like it was a necessity, maybe you felt good enough is good enough, whatever. This is, this is a real good insight to God and how he works and how he deals with people. And it's important, I'll, I'll share with you at, at the end, how God hasn't changed this approach even from the old covenant that he had with Israel to the new covenant that he has with all humanity who are willing to come to Jesus Christ, all right? He still is God, and he still works the same way. Malachi says he's going to come, and he's going to reveal himself. And here's the way it's going to happen. He starts out, and we'll just talk about this point, number one, is that what precedes the Lord is always this message of repentance that's being heralded, that's being spoken. He sends a prophet. Jesus comes, and before he begins his earthly ministry, who comes before him? John the Baptist, what's his message? Prepare the way of the Lord. That's his message. Get ready. God's getting ready to do something. It's the same thing. God's Holy Spirit is seeking to prepare the church, to prepare his people to get right with God, all right, and to enter into a genuine, real, consolidated, committed effort to live for God in their lives. And he, he, he starts this way. Here's a message you need to hear. It happens the same way. Paul was talking to the church in Rome, and Gary's been doing a great job in the book of Romans, and a few weeks down the road, he'll, he'll get to these chapters where he talks about where the Lord, where, where Romans, Paul's telling the Roman church, hey, there's people who need to hear the gospel, but how shall they hear, and how should they ever be saved if they're not spoken to, if no one goes and preaches to them? God has chosen, New Testament puts it this way, the foolishness of preaching. God uses a message, but it's not just, I just can't get up and come up with a sermon or come up with a message or come up with a thing. It really has to be founded upon the Word of God, all right? It comes from God's Word, and God raises up His Word. He raises up people who will speak His Word, and He tells the people in that Word what the expectations are and what He's like and what's demanded upon them. And He says here, when I come to my temple, I'm going to send the messenger, and he will clear the way before me whether it was John the Baptist or the prophet Malachi or Isaiah or Jeremiah or the Apostle Paul, there was always a message that was preached in the beginning with every move of God. And it was a message that dealt with, yes, the love of God and the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. Salvation's available. New life can be had. You can be a changed individual, but something has to happen. You got to deal with it. You have to make a decision. That's the preaching of repentance. The preaching of repentance brings forth not only that which is right and good and just and holy about God, but it also willingly says, here's where we are. We are not just. We are not holy. We are not righteous, but he is, all right? But if that message is never shared, people think they can just walk into a relationship with a holy God in an unholy manner, but you can't. That's why Jesus said these words as he shared these messages. He said, except you repent, you will perish. I know the word repent is kind of a cuss word in modern church today, all right? We don't use those words like repent and sin, you know, and talk about specific sins anymore. But that's why we're in such a desperate need of revival, because we won't deal with the real issues that are plaguing us. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to go to an oncologist who's a specialist in cancer, but I don't want him saying that C word to me. <laughs> You know, I don't want to deal with that, you know. That's just ludicrous, all right? That's insane. We want to go to a doctor. We want a doctor who's going to tell us the truth, where our problem is and how it can be fixed and what the antidote, the prescription, whatever the course I must take. Even if it means I have to go under a knife, let's deal with this problem. In your spiritual life, if you're not willing to deal with the negatives and the sin and the things that God is opposed to in life, how can you ever have God on your side? How can you have God working in you and working for you and ministering to you and, and helping you and assisting you and comforting you and empowering you and protecting you? All those things which God our Heavenly Father desires to do in our lives, if we're not willing to deal with what's wrong in our lives, we'll never experience the grace of God in our lives. There has to be a willing admission where I'm wrong, all right? What keeps me from doing that? It, it's really just pride. And it, I believe it's pride on the part of preachers who won't be truthful with people. I believe it's just pride in their life. They don't want to hurt somebody's feeling. They don't want to hinder the offering. They don't want to hurt the crowd. They don't want to run somebody off. I mean, you've heard me say before, where are you going to run them off to? Hell number two? <laughs> I mean, Seriously. We want, to, we want to be honest with people. So why? That people can be honest with themselves so they can discover the treasure of Jesus Christ in their life. But as long as your inward focus and your life is focused around you and doing what you want and what your will is and what your way is versus God's will way and, 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 and design for your life, you're not going to get there. So what has to happen 
is the preaching of repentance has to come. This is what Jesus did. Just look at his life testimony. He wasn't afraid to call sin, sin. All right? He wasn't, he just did it. And he upset a lot of people to the point where they crucified him. All right? That's what it got down to because the world, for the most part, doesn't like to hear that message and it isn't palatable and it is offensive, right, to, 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 the, to, the, to the unregenerate mind. Christians can get into that pride kind of lifestyle where it becomes, well, we want to hear that kind of preaching. I just want to hear somebody encourage me. I'm going to tell you the greatest thing, the greatest source of encouragement will be from someone who has the guts to tell you, you're not right with God and you need to get right with God and God's got a way for you to get right with God and here's the plan and here's the purpose, but you're going to have to admit, you know, you're wrong and he's right, that you're lost and he's Savior and you're not Lord and he is, all right? But if that doesn't happen, how can we experience revival? How can we even come to salvation you know, Christianity is not about you being a better person and living a good life and earning your way into heaven. Christianity is about throwing off an old life and embracing a brand new life. That I'm dead to the old life. I'm alive in a new life. I'm a new Christian in Christ Jesus. This is the message Jesus shared with the rich young ruler. All right. Now, here's a church member candidate for you. He comes running to Jesus. He's wealthy. He's a, he's, he's a leader in the community. You know, and most preachers say, how can, I, how can I have eternal life? Well, just join the church, Bubba. You know, you can have eternal life. No. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus, you know, what? interestingly, Jesus starts sharing the law of Moses with him. You know, that shall not do this, you shall not do this, you shall not do this. And he said, you know, I've done that all my life. Now, you and I both know that Jesus Christ's message throughout the Gospels is not ever telling us that the law is going to save us, is it? His is always a message, you can't save yourself, you need me, I'm going to die for you, I'm going to take your sins upon me, I am the way, I'm the truth and life, it's not going to be the law, it's not going to be good living, it's not going to be Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, you know, that's my addition to it, that none of that's going to, it's going to be me that saves. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I will pay the I will suffer in your place, I will die in your place for you so that you can have this gift of eternal life. But why is Jesus dealing with that guy this way? It's the same reason that we're talking about here and the same reason you sit through the Scripture until we deal with who we are, how we're ever going to be changed. This guy was living in a world of delusion. He thought he was good enough. Why? Because he hadn't done that or that or that. Thou shalt not this. Well, he hadn't done it. Thou shalt not do that. He hadn't done it. Thou shalt not do that. Well, I've kept all that since my youth up. But then Jesus personalizes it because he knows this young man's heart. And he says, listen, I'll tell you what you need to do. You really want to have eternal life? Then you go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now, that is not the plan of salvation, so don't build it out of that, all right? I don't know how many of y'all willing to give everything over to the Lord anyway today and sign it over your house and everything else and give it all to the poor and follow Jesus. But what Jesus was doing was making a very direct part to him that he had broken the very first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before you. He had a God. It was money. His philosophy of life centered around materialism. It centered around stuff and things. If I just have money, I'll be secure. If I just have money, I'll be safe. If I just have money, I'll, I'll be happy. If I just have money, I don't have to be afraid of the future. If I just have money, I'll be protected. And so Jesus turns the law to a very personal thing. He says, hey, and by the way, this is what the apostle Paul was telling us about the law. He said, the law is really just our teacher. God never gave the law to save anybody. He gave the law to expose us to ourselves and what our hearts are like. And how the, all these things that, you know, that we're not to do, those are all the things we do. Now, before you get too haughty and say, well, I don't do that, take the Ten Commandments, read it from the book of Exodus Day, and go, and for the next 48 hours, don't break a one of those. Let me know how that works for you. Because <laughs> that's what James says. If you break one, you've broken them all. And it usually gets down to the one you broke is you have no other gods. We just make God of ourselves, and we don't make it out of money. We want what we want. We don't want what God wants. We want my will, not his will. Not my will, not thy will. That's just the same thing. And this is the way. It said the young man went away very sorrowful. He didn't have a good time at church that day. And he probably didn't go back. <laughs> Might have found another one that wasn't so harsh and so offensive. A little more palatable for the seeker. But it's truth that liberates us, is it not? We want people lying to us. Jesus said, thou shalt not, because he wanted to show you not only what, what we are capable of doing, it's what we do automatically because we have a sin nature. He was showing us what God's like. Number one, there is no other God but God. Stated plain. 
Even the scripture later says, there I am God and there's none before me and there's none after me. There's nobody like God. That's why we call him holy. There ain't nothing like him and no one like him. When thou shalt not steal, God saying, I'm not a thief. <laughs> when God says that shalt not commit immorality and sexual sins and adultery, primar- all these things that fall in the category, God saying, I'm not that. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not. He's just showing us what he's like. Basically, God's saying, that's not what I am. And you can be like me, but you can't do it by yourself. You need me. And so there's this preaching, whether it's Jesus or the Apostle Paul or the Old Testament, New Testament, that always precedes a move of God. Why? Because we need the mirror of God's Word to look in and see where we're really at. We don't want to be like in James where it says, be that forgetful. We see ourselves because that's literally what preaching like this is. It's holding up a mirror, you know, that we see ourselves. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And there he is with the woman at the well. And he, he's telling, hey, I am the water of life, you know. You drink this well, you'll never thirst again. Well, I've heard the Messiah, and she gets religious on him. And he said, you know, and, and, but he just turns it back to her and says, listen, you know, uh, you're living in adultery. You have an immoral lifestyle. And she ran to town after repentance, and she said, come meet a man who told me everything about myself. I think that's what repentance preaching is. We're just letting people know what they already know. <laughs> she already knew where she was at. She just didn't know how to get out. She didn't know how she could be free. She didn't know how she could experience deliverance. But it was through Christ. So this literally pent is a word in the Greek language, mentonia. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right, mentonoi. But it means it's a change of mind. But it's not just like, well, I think I'll have a root beer instead of a Sprite. <laughs> it's a change, a deep change of mind that produces a change of direction, a change of course. It's like with the rich young ruler. When Jesus is speaking to him, he's saying, you're going to have to change the focus of your emotional life. You love something more than God. You love money. You're going to have to change the, the direction of your physical life even. You know, you're following your will. You're following money, but you're going to have to follow me. You're going to have to change the, the course, not only of your emotional life, but of your spiritual life. The focus is going to have to be different. That you're not going to be satisfied spiritually with this world and with sin and with stuff. You're going to be satisfied with Christ. So a change of mind, and this was the message repeatedly of Christ, and it's a change of mind about the way you're living, about what you're doing, about where you've been, about what you've been. All that is a change of mind. I realize what God has for me, so I would rather have that than have this. And it's a change of mind which causes me to turn and now begin to follow a different source of life, a different pursuit for peace, a different pursuit for joy. So there's really two sides to repentance when we choose to repent. One, it's that forsaking side. We realize this is wrong, I am wrong. And two, the other side, the flip side, is the following side. The Apostle Paul talked in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 about a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. He said, worldly sorrow, what is that? That's just when I'm exposed to what I'm doing wrong. I know my sin is in my life, and I really feel bad about it. How despicable me, you know? I just loathe myself. That's just worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is when he says, oh, despicable me, but I ain't even staying here. <laughs> he said, godly sorrow produces a, a sorrow is the way he put it in that passage. It produces a repentance without regret is the terminology he used. Have you ever turned away from something in your life? You knew it was wrong and you think you're going to repent all right, or you think you're repenting but you turn to walk away from it, but you still got your eye back looking at it. That's repentance with regret. That's not godly sorrow. It's not godly repentance. I get my focus off of it. I quit letting it predominate my thought life and dominate my my emotional life and my physical life. I've now set my affections on things above, as it says in Colossians, and not on things below. That's a godly sorrow. Without regrets. I don't regret leaving that. I don't regret quitting that. I don't regret stopping that. I don't regret, you know, moving away from those things. Because I've experienced something far better. And he says, he talked about in Corinthians, he says, man, what zeal you have. What avenging of wrong you now have. You know, what longing there's now in your life. You've demonstrated real repentance, he said, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So it's a change of direction. It's a change the way I think regarding my sin. It's a change I, I, I have in my life regarding the, you know, the, 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 where it was. I saw what it did. I saw the results. I saw the fruit of living that way. And now I've turned, and I'm living a brand new life. Now, that's the first step. Are we going to respond that when the Lord speaks to us, 
about something in our life that he says in his word is contrary to his will, am I going to do that? Or am I going to justify or rationalize? There are those theologians today who love to take the Bible and now rationalize and twist and pervert the scriptures. They even have a theology that came out maybe 15, 20 years ago. I think I've addressed this before in sermons in the past called open theism. Open theism, it just says, you know, well, uh, God, God was said that was sin back then, but it's not sin today because God's, God's advanced. God's modernized his thinking. God has grown up some. That's the mindset. But they don't understand that God is the eternal God is always the same. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. So <clears throat> understand, if there's something in my heart God said wrong, it's wrong. And no matter of justification or rationalization or cultural change, is going to change the mind of God in that. So if I'm going to get into this place of thriving in my life, I'm going to have to get in the place of believing what God said and trust in him and believe in him. But also, as that happens, he says, then the Lord whom you seek, that's part of it, you're seeking the Lord now, that's part of repentance. The Lord whom you seek, he said, will come to his temple. So what happens next? God begins to show himself strong enough. God begins to show up in your life. God begins to speak to you. God begins to deal with you. God begins to make himself known in your life. Now, I know there's some here who say, well, Brother Joe, God, God is here anyway. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. And you're right. All right, God, God's here at church today. God's down at the bar. Because he's God. He's everywhere, right? God's everywhere. But understand, God is not showing himself mighty. And God is not showing himself powerful. And God is not showing himself, let me put it this way. He's not manifesting his presence. Although he's present, he's not showing the glory of his presence everywhere. And what happens when we begin to respond and genuinely really repent, quit playing games with God, he begins to show up. And he begins to, you know, I, I tell people all the time, that God, God doesn't tell me to lay something down, that he doesn't fill that area up with something better in my life. It's that principle of replacement. You know, that God, there's something that will take the place of of, of that's left by the vacuum of abandoning things in my life and denying things in my life and turn, there's something far greater and richer and more meaningful and fuller in my life. If I'm willing to hear him and willing to trust him, he'll do something in my life. But this is just the, the, the natural order of the way things work. He says, the messenger of the covenant. You gotta love this. Now, obviously, the covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, right? We talked about communion last week, the new covenant, which means that we can come to God by grace and, and he'll forgive us of our sins and make us new persons. Jeremiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born about the coming Messiah and that he would bring a new covenant, a new covenant. And in Jeremiah chapter 33, he, he, he describes it. I think it's chapter 31 around verse 33, 32, 33, right in that area. He's describing the new covenant. And he basically said there's four parts. Jeremiah said there's four parts of this new covenant. He said part number one is God will forgive your sins and you will know it. He said, what's so neat about that? One, having my sins forgiven. Because if your sins aren't forgiven, they're a heavy load to call around with you all the time. David the psalmist said, they're like a heavy burden over me. I can't even stand up on them. I can't bear it anymore. It's a heavy load to carry around your own sin. The guilt, the condemnation, all the things that arrive from sin that accompany sin in our life. He said, God's going to forgive their sins, and they're going to be aware of it. There's nothing more exciting than that. being forgiven. The more exciting part is comes under, and the knowing it, and the enjoying it, and then working in it. Knowing I'm not going to have to count for all that junk. I'm not going to pay the price for that. Jesus already did it. My sins are forgiven. I'm a free man. I'm a liberated person. And if I go back and try to pick up some area in my life, then I begin to sense the condemnation again and the conviction and the, and the rejection and the guilt that takes place with all that. The Lord says, I'll forgive their sins. The second part of the covenant says, and I'll write my law on their hearts. All right? What does that mean? Ouch. All right? Is that like angina pain or something? No. I'll write my law on the hearts. means that... You'll know what God's desire is in your life, and you'll know what God's will is in your life. But the idea of the way it's written in, in the Hebrew language, that not only will you know it, you'll want it. Amen. You know, I'll write my law upon their heart. There'll be a passion for it. There'll be a desire to do it. There'll be a hunger to say, I want what God wants. I, I desire what God desires for my life. That's part of the new covenant. The third part of the covenant is that not only will I, I forgive their sins, which is a hallelujah, 
amen, that's awesome. But two, he'll give me a desire to do his will, and he does that when the Holy Spirit comes in our life. But he says, and I will be their God. That's good news. One, because I tried being my own God. Anybody else done that before? That stinks. It doesn't work, all right? And maybe you're there today. You're still trying to dictate your life. Understand there's a hopeless, hopeless way to live your life. But when God comes in and you realize he's your God, what comes with it? Well, my God says I can call him Father. I have a heavenly Father. I have a Father who's God, all right? So while you sit around and brag about what your daddy does, my daddy's God. All right. God is my heavenly Father, which means he's pledged to me. You don't have to read the Bible very much to find this out. He's pledged to me his protection. You mess with me, there's more than meets the eye. All right. He's pledged to me my provisions. I don't have to sweat the economy. I don't have to whine about Wall Street and the market and how good the annuities working, you know. I don't worry about 401s and all those. Hey, listen, I'll take steps and try to do the things that the Bible teaches us or basic wisdom, you know, and, and how we handle and as stewards what God gives to us and provide for the future like the ant, all right? God gives us instruction. But hey, if everything falls apart tomorrow, I'm okay. All right? If you fire me tomorrow after this sermon, I'm okay. I'm good, all right? I'm taken care of. I don't know about you, that's a tremendous amount of peace because there's a lot of people living around you in this world. Well, the economy's good this month, but what about next month? And what about next year? I've got a good job right now, but what if they decide to cut back and, you know, they're going to get rid of us old guys first, you know? Or they might cut us young guys because we don't know what we're doing. You don't have to worry about these things. Let the cuts come. Jesus is Lord. He's going to take care of me. Well, what if gas goes up again? Let it go up to $50 a pint. I'm going to have all the gas I need. Amen. Amen. God's going to take care of me. That's part of the new covenant. The fourth part says, and, they will, and all who come and, so, and join the covenant, all of them will know me intimately. In other words, not only do I have God, I know God. There's a relationship. I remember back when, and, and uh, Margaret, you ought to remember this, back was it Northwoods Apartments over there? We had a ministry there and stuff, and we, had, we, were, we were over there near the Northwoods Apartments over 1960 there when we first started, you know, and we were in a, we were in a school there at first, and then we went to a, to a roller skating rink, and we were reaching these apartments a lot, and we had people on staff that lived in the apartments as well. Ricky was on staff, and he lived in the apartment, and Rodney Moore and some other guys were part of the church back then, and we were out just witnessing one night there in the apartment complex, I had this young lady come up to me, and I was trying to explain to her that she could have a personal relationship with God. You know, people use that terminology a lot. A lot. Apparently, she had never heard it. It freaked her out. I can know God personally. And I got to think, yeah, you ought to be freaked out. That's awesome. That I can have him as my companion in my life, here and now. Yes, he's holy, incredible, awesome God above all things, but that he's He's allowed me to come in and be a part of his family, and he calls me his child. Hallelujah. And he's committed himself. That's the new covenant which so many people are afraid of. What are you afraid of? You think God's going to mess my life up ever get right? No, God's going to fix your life, give you life, restore life where you've lost life, and show you what real living is all about. So first of all, what? Preaching of repentance. Second of all, there's this, there's this manifestation of, of God's presence. And as that happens, God shows up. What happens then? Well, he says there, that then, then he sets his refiner in a purifier of silver and gold, right? He starts cleaning us up, all right? Listen, there's a lot of stuff in our lives that's got to get washed out, all right? There's a lot of stuff that's got to come out. He calls him, he says, I will set his refiner in a purifier. This, this is one particular word there where he's talking about that purifying. It's, it's the word uh, kabas. It means that the, it's the word fuller. It may say a fuller in, your, in, in the King James Version of that. But not only he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a purifier, a fuller. And, it, and it's a word which described people who did laundry, basically. All right. And, and the way it was done, the basis of doing this was they take very dirty items like laundry, and they'd get them very wet and soak them down. They'd wring them out, and then they'd start beating them against the rocks, or they'd trample them with their feet on hard surfaces to get all the grit and the grime, the oils and everything out. And they'd repeat the process till all the junk was out, and then they'd go to a more rinsing. Today, you know, you, you have a, mach a washing machine, and what's it do? It, it tumbles and drops stuff, and it bangs against the walls and does all that stuff. And, you know, the idea is it's a, it's a very light form of what we're talking about here. 
This wasn't such an easy process if you were a shirt. <laughs> Sometimes it's not an easy process if you're a Christian. Who doesn't want to get the dirt out? Who doesn't want to deal with the impurities in our life? There's a question in Psalms 24, and it's in verse 3, and the answer is found in verse 24, verse 4. Verse 3 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who's going to be able to stand in God's holy place? In other words, who's going to get in God's presence and enjoy it and live it, experience it? I said the answer is in verse 4. It says, Who? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Now, that's talking about your actions and your lifestyle, what you're doing in your life and how you're living in your heart. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto pride or vanity and has not sworn deceitfully. In other words, your actions are right, your heart is right, your motives are right. How do you get clean like that? You can't without God. And that's why he says, I'm the refiner. I'm the purifier. I'll wash you. I'll clean. Isaiah chapter 1, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, I shall wash them white as snow. God says, I'll, I'll, I'm the cleaner. I'm the laundry guy. I'll take care of the dirt, but you're going to have to submit the dirt. You're going to have to turn the items over to the Lord. That's why our sin has to be confronted. That's why it has to be confessed and why it has to be forsaken. We just can't confess it and not forsake it. We need to be made clean. And the cleansing part comes as we, well, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. You say, well, Brother Joe, this is so ingrained in my life. Listen, God's got a, a way of getting those things that are ingrained clean. He's the refiner. He's the fuller. He will ultimately change your passions, your desires. They can in time change. Now, it doesn't mean that the old nature is not still present and yelling out, but it no longer has the upper hand. You know, well, Brother Joe, this is the way I am, the way I'm born. No, 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 no. That doesn't work when you come to Jesus because he's the changer. If any man's in Christ, they are a new creation. You become a new person. Doesn't mean I'm still not drawn or tempted or, or think about those things, but now it means I need to turn away from the regret factor and really start following and focusing on the new life and the new person and the change that God has made in my life and enjoy those things. God's the one who wants to clean us up. He's the goldsmith, so to say. And what, what's encouraging about this? It says that when he appears with his people, he's going to refine them like silver and gold. I don't know how it is that in my fallen nature, God can see anything of intrinsic value in me, but he does. He refers to me, even filled with my impurities, as gold and silver. He has, there's some value. If there was no value, Jesus would not have died for nothing. He died for nothing in a lot of ways if we don't give him our lives. But it's not in vain, the Bible says. I've given my life to Christ. And, you know, it's, God gives me the strength now to enjoy this now. He gives me the power to be the gold and the silver that he sees in me. But without him, I can't. It's impossible. My morality, my influence, my efforts are just not going to happen. But what happens when revival comes? He starts dealing with the grime and the grit and the dirt that's in there. The fire comes on, and he begins to process and clean me out, cleans my life. It was a great thing that, that night in September on a Thursday night, I gave my life to Jesus way back when. And I said, here, Lord, I've made a mess of my life. Can you, if you can do anything with it, I just give you my heart. I'm a sinner. I know it. If you can do anything with me, here I am. I'd, my hopes were pretty small at that point. I really didn't, you know, my biggest fear, I don't hope this thing lasts, you know, past the night. You know, I was sincere as I could be and honest as I could be. I really want this to work. I didn't realize, you know, how the Lord was, would be so committed to me and so committed to you to nurture us along, to grow us up, to not show us all the grim and grime at one time if I would have killed every one of us. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> but to deal with us in this process of cleansing us and sanctifying us and making us clean and whole, what a mighty God we serve. When revival comes, you won't be able to hold on to the dirt, folks. You're going to have to let go of it. And you're going to have to trust God with it. The fourth step is this. He says, that then your offerings will be acceptable in my sight and pleasant. Now, this is interesting to me because, you know, these people, they were, they were presenting their sacrifices and their gifts and their offerings to the Lord, right? Here they're presenting them, and they're coming to the temple, and they're presenting offerings. But God is saying, not accepting it. Why wouldn't he accept their offering? Because their hearts were not right. Now, that's another issue. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christian who won't even present an offering. All right, this part of the message is really not for you. I have another sermon for you. Yeah, repent. Come on. 
Get over that. Your love for money is ruining your walk. Your love for money is going to ruin the abundance that God has for you in your life. You need to get things in order and learn what first fruits giving is all about in your life. Begin to honor the Lord with the substance that God has given you. You're not going to be given any more until you start. You can be trustworthy with what you have. Learn how to honor God. You don't honor, listen. I mean, you're not even in the playing field of this sermon right now yet. You got to you got to jump on across the board. And say, okay, I need to learn how to, to honor God with my financially in my life. But he's saying here, for, even for those who have learned the lesson. And you, you know about first fruits giving and beyond, and you had your benevolent, liberal person in your giving for the kingdom of God. God might be saying to you, I'm not blessing your offerings because your heart's not right. And I've heard people say, you know, I've not been tithing. The Bible says God opened the windows of heaven. God said he'd pour out the blessings of God. God said he'd rebuke the devourer, the devil, off my finances. I'm not saying it, Pastor. My question is always this. Well, then you've got a dirty heart. Why, what's, what's going on in your life? All right? It's not just the act of giving. It's the act of giving as an act of worship. Amen. That this is something I do to honor God. It's not just rote. I've learned how to give. Praise the Lord. Write a check. Put an offering plate. Go online. Punch in my offering. This is an act of worship. This is what I honor God with. This is where I bless. I'm a blessing to the kingdom of God and to the, the cause of Christ and to the cause of the gospel and, the, and reaching the lost and, and nurturing the saints and discipling people. But if my heart's not right, I've lost that enthusiasm. I've lost that joy. I've lost that excitement in it. You know what I'm saying? So I get my heart right, and God says, hey, that's when I, I good you give, but you didn't give. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. That doesn't mean, I'm just so happy to give an offering today. Because <laughs> it comes from the word hilarious. That's about as hilarious as I could get for the moment. I'm sorry. But that's not what it's talking about. It's, it's talking about a heart that's excited to, to be a blessing. And to honor the Lord as he has honored you. In other words, it's worship. He says, when your heart gets right, and I'm out and able to cleanse the things in your life that aren't right, then you watch what I'll do in the practical areas of your life, in the practical places in your life. So there'll be this presentation of acceptable gifts. And the last thing in this process, God's nature is revealed. You know, in verse 2, I think two times in verse 2, he says, I will come, I will come. And we talked about this just a little bit a while ago, but he'll manifest his presence. In fact, in verse 6, he calls himself, he says this way, I am the Lord and I change not. We made reference to that too, right? Watch how this works together. Theologians, we've used this word, I know I've shared it with you a hundred times, but I will say it again. It's the word immutability or immutable. That's a terminology that's used to describe God's unchanging nature. All right, that God has never changed. He is immutable. That God is always the same from beginning to the end. God didn't have to grow up. He's already grown up, all right? God didn't have to mature and learn something from a worldly culture so that he could change his mind about stuff. No, God is God. And he's always been God. And he's always, let me put it this way, he's always been for what he's been for. And he's always been against what he's been against. He makes it very clear throughout the scripture what he's for what he's against, doesn't he? And he has a way of making it very clear to us what he's for in our lives and what he's against. He has a way of convicting us and convincing us. In Hosea, the Lord refers to himself. He said, I, and he's trying to show them himself in the nature of the people. He says, I'm like the former rain and the latter rain. In other words, there's certain seasons you expect the certain rains and they come. Now, the reason they don't come is from some abnormality. The norm is this, all right? Now, the rains might not come in the children of Israel in the form of latter rains because, hey, if, there's, you know, if you guys are being rebellious and you won't honor me, you know, I may stop the former rain and latter rain. He said, but as an illustration, there's, there's some things about me, God says, that are understandable and even predictable. And the more that I understand what he's for and what he's against, his immutability and the immutability of his nature then the more aware of him I am in my life. But here's the thing about this issue called revival. God says some things very clearly about salvation. Here's the way you come to Christ. Here's the way you earn eternal life. He says very things about once we are experienced salvation, how we live that life, how we experience the fullness in that life, how we can thrive, not survive, right? And the amazing part, what God is saying, he says, if you do this, I'll do this. If you turn to me in repentance and faith, I'll save you and you'll receive eternal life. As a Christian, if you're going to grow and mature 
and walk with God, then you need to do this and not that. Because I'm for this and against that. So there's some things that are understandable. And that if I do that, you know, it, it, that Second Chronicles passage on revival. If my people, which are called by my name, and then he just lists some things. If you'll humble yourself, Amen. if you'll turn from your wicked ways, yeah. if you'll call on me in repentance and prayer and fasting, I'll hear your voice. I'll, I'll touch your life. I'll heal your land. Yeah. It's, it's that, do this, this happens. And what God is saying in this passage, these things I want you to know about me, you can expect. In other words, if you'll seek me, like it says, the messenger of the covenant, whom you seek, I'll come. But when I show up, I love what he said, who's going to be able to, to abide? Who's going to be able to handle it when I show up? Because I will sit and I'll refine your lives. I'll purify your hearts. You have to deal with the things that are wrong in your life and get them right. But I will do something in your life. If you'll make a decision, I will manifest my presence. I will make your life thrive. I will bring life to an abundant level. I'll have, you'll not only have peace in this life, you'll have peace as you face the next life because there's no fear of death. I'll do that in you. The world can't do it, but God can. So what's he saying? I'm, I haven't changed my mind about this. There's this, this immutable relationship that if you'll, you know, and what this causes me to think of, and I think we should close with this, is that you can be sure that God will manifest himself in one of two ways is what I think this passage is saying. He's going to manifest himself in salvation and deliverance and revival and victory and freedom. That's, that's the way my personal preference is. Or he's going to manifest himself in judgment because he is a just God. He's, a, he's, a very, he's not like the world justice. His justice is always equitable. It's always right. It's always done correctly. But if the wages of sin, if the judgment on sin is death, I think I need to pay attention because I have lived in sin, and I've chosen myself over God. So if God's ways don't change, I better realize that I can't, I can't just tell myself, well, I'm going to live this way. It doesn't matter. Or I don't believe that way. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, that's those religious people. Hey, you know, I'm, if God's God and he's true and his word is true, you better lock down. It's going to be a hard road in this life and especially the life to come because you will face judgment. And the only way we escape that kind of judgment is to realize that somebody took the judgment that I deserved on themselves. His name is Jesus. He's my deliverer. He's my Savior. So God will show up in your life one way or the other. How do you want it? We have to choose. We have to make choices. I want to, I want to close with a quote. It's a couple paragraphs from A.W. Tozer. who was a great man of God. Wrote about revivals used, used mightily by God. And it's written out of an article he called The Root of Righteousness. And he's talking this about pretty much the context is we need revival because if we just going through life in general, there's a constant pull from the world and the flesh and the devil, right? It's kind of like Billy Sunday said, we need a bath. But listen to the way he put it here. <clears throat> called The Root of Righteousness. It's an agriculture you know, illustration. Every farmer knows the hunger of the wilderness. And there is no modern machinery, no improved agricultural method that can ever quite destroy it. No matter how well prepared the farmer is and no matter how well he prepares the soil or how well he keeps the fences or how carefully he paints the buildings, let the owner neglect for just a while his prized and valued acreage, his land. And that land will revert again to the wild. And that land will be swallowed up by the jungle or the wasteland. The bias of nature is toward the wilderness, never toward the fruitful field. That, we repeat, and that every farmer knows. What is true of the field is also true of our souls. The truth is that no spiritual experience, however revolutionary, can exempt us from temptation. And what is temptation? But the effort of the wilderness to encroach upon our newly cleared field. The jungle will creep in and seek to swallow up the areas that we have made free by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it is only watchfulness and prayer that can preserve these moral gains won for us through the operation of God's grace. The neglected heart will soon be a heart overrun with worldly thoughts, and the neglected life will soon become moral chaos. What's he saying? If we're not making choices, 
if we're not letting the Lord continue to purify our lives, if we get consent to live with some disobedience or rebellion in our heart, then the natural thing will be for that to overtake every area of our life. Just as a farmer tends his field, this field has to be tended. That's why we have a call for revival. That's why we have a call for renewal in our lives. But with that call comes a necessity to repent of the things that we've held on to our lives, the things we've called precious or needed, which really aren't, the very things that are destroying us, the very things that are inviting the enemy of our soul to come in and do his very worst, not his best. So I would encourage you today, as you're looking at 2019 and taking and having a year that is a celebrative year, that's a glorious year, that's a victorious year, that's an overcoming year, that is a year filled with the grace and the abundance of God upon your life. If you really want to thrive in your spiritual walk in life, then pay attention to that message of revival because that's where it really starts. Are the things in my life that God has spoken to me about, things that I've kind of kept looking at my shoulder over, trying to move this way but still holding on and anchored to something in the past of sin because I just won't let go. Let it go. God will give you the grace of repentance but you have to let it go. And then you set your focus on the things that are before you, not behind you, and the things that are above and see what God will do in your life. Revive to thrive. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I'm going to ask each one of you to have an open heart this morning. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who's going to have fellowship with God? That's what that means. But he has clean hands and a pure heart. Could you pray as David the psalmist prayed? Lord, search me. Look in my heart. See if there's anything in there that is deceitful, anything in there that's wicked, anything in there that's unrighteous, anything in there that's destructive to my spiritual walk and my relationship with you. If you can be honest today, God can start a fresh work in your life today. This altar is open this morning. It's available to those who'd be willing to come and find a place before the Lord between you and your heavenly Father and your high priest Jesus who shed his blood for you to come and find a place between you and him to lay things on this altar. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. Would you be willing to admit that God is right and you're not? Would you be willing to embrace his forgiveness today? And equally as important, his cleansing, that he'll wash you of that today. And a revival can begin in your heart and life. But don't minimize your sin. Don't say, well, everybody else is doing it. It's culturally acceptable. It's just a little lie. It's just a little unforgiveness. It's just a little bitterness. It's just a little of not being responsive to the Lord and my finances. It's just a little. As long as you minimize it, you'll never be free. Don't walk away sorrowful like that rich young ruler did with Jesus today because he didn't want to deal with what God was really saying to him. The Lord has this unique capacity to reach down into your heart and say right to your heart the word, the thing, the issue that needs to be dealt with. That's what you should come to the altar with today. In a moment when we begin to sing and worship the Lord, your first act of worship should be an act of repentance before the Lord. Say, Lord, here it is, and I've held on to this. Please forgive me. Wash me clean. Set me free. I know, Father, I probably brought this here before, but today much as I possibly know how. I'm repenting. I need your grace. I need your power in my life. Maybe you're here today and you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus. Why don't you come to any one of these men gathered here at this front with me or to me and say, listen, I need to settle this issue about my eternity and about the forgiveness of my sin. I want to give my life to Christ today. What a great moment that'll be in your life and what it'll be, it'll be the turning point for the rest of your life. But it starts with you and him. Would you give him your life today? Would you ask him to forgive you of your sins and come in and make you a new person? I believe there's multiple people here today who need to do that. Maybe you've kind of disguised that need with church membership or good works or good deeds or giving. Who knows? But it's time to be honest with the Lord. He knows the heart. And he's exposing the heart to you. Would you be diligent to respond to him by saying, yes, Lord, it's my life you want first and foremost. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You've been praying about what the Lord have you serve. He's been putting Believer's Fellowship on your heart. Don't hesitate today. Come, take one of these men by and say, I want to be a part of what God's doing here. 
I want to be a part of Believer's Fellowship. But whatever the Lord is saying as we begin this song, I'm going to ask you to just move out. Father, we know you know each one of our hearts and lives. Touch us today. Draw us to yourself. Don't let us hide, excuse, or justify. Help us to come to this altar today in the name of Jesus. Would you come? Would you step out? Let's respond to what the Holy Spirit's saying. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I tasted and see of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I taste it and see. Of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome.
I'm going to answer the question myself. I'm going to answer it with a raised hand. But I want you to be absolutely honest with yourself. How many in this room could honestly, pure-heartedly say, Pastor Joe, a message of repentance is one I need to hear in my own personal life. Because there's something the Lord has spoken to me about, and I've been struggling with it. It's been an issue. And I've kind of looked at it with that repentance with regrets when I do. I pray today would be a breaking of that bondage in my thoughts and my heart concerning that thing, that issue, because I truly want revival in my life. How many can say, Pastor, with every head bowed, just between you and me, say, Pastor, that's me. Would you slip your hand up? Amen. With hand raised, let's just go to the Lord. Father, this hand means I mean business with you. And I would acknowledge this with my brothers in the church today, Father, my sisters. And Lord, that thing or things, you know what they are. But Lord, don't quit dealing with us. Don't quit speaking to it. Don't quit moving on it. But Lord, help our focus not to be on it, but upon you. That whenever it comes, we raise the shield of faith and pull the sword of the word. And we stand for you. So we trust you now for the grace to overcome that you've already promised and given us. We thank you for the promise of the power of your word in our lives. We thank you for the victory that's through faith in Jesus. Touch these lives. Walk us in to an anointed revival time in this season of our life. As you get closer, Lord, we know the days will grow darker. But may we shine as lights in this dark age. For the glory of Jesus and for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name we pray this. Somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated. Can't encourage you enough to be a part of this whole series of messages because each one is uniquely tied to the next one. And so as we talk about these things and thriving in our lives, uh, we want to root out the weeds that would hinder the, the blossoms from taking place in our lives and enjoy what God is doing in our lives. I'm excited you're here today. Bring someone to church with you next Sunday. We've got, like I say, this message series will continue. They can be able to get in wherever they are. God will speak to them. But for those of us who are attending Sunday, I think you'll get a little bit more out of it as you piece these messages together and what the Lord is saying to us as a church, I believe. I love you and I praise God for you and thank you for being part of our worship service today. Brother Gary's going to come with a few closing announcements and then we will be dismissed. Hallelujah. Amen. How about Stephanie coming up? Yeah. Stephanie Arms is going to come up and, and give an announcement. Good morning. So as you guys can see, we're going to be having our uh, annual chili cook-off again. We're going to be having that on the last Sunday of February. So that'll be February 24th. Um, this is also going to be an outreach ministry. Again, it's just going to be just like last year, but we're going to be having a meeting this uh, last Sunday, actually in January. So that's going to be on January 27th. And it's just going to be open to the BF family any neighbors, any friends that you guys know that love to cook chili or that are cookers, um, we encourage you guys to bring them. And this meeting is just going to be uh, just regarding some of the concerns that you guys had last year. Some people had really great ideas, um, although we couldn't implement them last year, but we can this year. We have a little bit of time to do that. 
But um, we just want to make it something to where everyone can enjoy it and everyone feel like, you know, they're part of, you know, the church family and everyone just really just having a really good time while we're raising money for the women's ministry. So we definitely just want to um, just encourage everybody to come and and just bring someone, even if you're not chili cooker, you know, you can just enjoy to eat. Just bring them anyway, and it'll be a good way for you guys to just bring someone to church. And we're going to be working with Robbie's ministry for the outreach ministry as well. So we're going to be um, getting together with them. We're going to be getting together volunteers for our event as well as his uh, outreach during this time too. So I just encourage everybody just to stay after church just for maybe 30 minutes. Um, Just have us go over everything. We're going to be handing out our agenda for the meeting and just know exactly what we're going to be doing for the chili cook-off this year. Thank you. Amen. And Stephanie, just so you know, I've been practicing. I actually made chili this weekend, so I'm getting ready. So I'm like, I'm ready. Uh, food baskets. Thank you for all uh, who gave to the food pantry. And a reminder, if you took a bag and haven't returned it, please do so. And hopefully not empty. Uh, make sure that if you took a bag that you, uh, there's, there's a list of contents that you could have put in there and return them to the church. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we are doing uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. We had about 27 people here on, on Wednesday. It was a great time of the Lord. We went over chapter one, uh, which is uh, God's judgment on the unrighteous. And so we're going to be going into chapter two, which is God's judgment on the righteous man. So you don't want to miss it. It'll be a great time. And actually, um, uh, you know, this Wednesday and, and over the summer, we did, you know, we, we did pies with the pastor and and, and a watermelon in the word. And so this Wednesday, we'll be starting to, we'll, we'll talk about maybe starting that again. And, and so you don't want to be, you don't want to miss out on Wednesday. E-Blast prayer line forms. If you do not receive the weekly E-Blast or the prayer request and you'd like to be put, uh, added to that list, there are forms out in the back. Please be sure to, or in the foyer, please be sure to fill that out and uh, drop it in the box so we can get you on that prayer list. We do not send our uh, distribution list out to third-party vendors, so you're not going to get any advertisements or anything like that. If you are a first-time visitor, you, there is a welcome card in the seat back in, uh, in front of you, uh, or if you have a prayer request, please do fill it out and drop it in the box. But if you're a new, uh, a new visitor, please complete this card. We're not asking for a lot of information, just you know, name, address, phone number, email address, how you heard about us. And at the end of the service, our pastor will enjoy the opportunity to meet you in our welcome center. Put a free gift in your hand. Uh, offering. I know Pastor Joe touched on it and we talk about it every week. But it is, it is truly a part of worship. It is truly a, a time that you have with God uh, and the things that he has blessed you with. So as he honors us, let's continue to honor him. And why not skip to the re- offering receptacle in the back? We should be cheerful. Amen. That God has blessed us with what we do have. Amen. Amen. Don't forget your evening, our evening services, Awana's Lift, Young Adults. And with that being said, you are Food Pantry. I already, already mentioned the bag, so we're good. All right. With that being said, you are dismissed. Thank you.